we've built a comprehensive set of applications that together make up the publishing platform. You recognize many of them because you're using them almost on a daily basis. Last year, we launched a brand new set of journal pages, the home for your work. Authors submit their work in a modern and easy to use submission system. These submissions are checked by state-of-the-art AI-powered algorithms to help us assess their quality. Chief editors get their overview in the digital editorial office, all together collaborate in the review forum. And of course, the published articles are beautiful and they come with great impact metrics that show the authors the reach of their work. So we've invested into technology since the very beginning. And I loved it that Camilla showed this picture of her and Henry in San Diego when they launched it, because already back then, they knew how important technology would be. And because of this foresight, it is today a key pillar that allows us to do quality at scale. And at Frontiers, technology empowers humans. That is very important. Every time we design something, we put the human in the driver's seat. So to use this analogy, we're not aiming to build a self-driving car, but instead, we want to make sure that the driver has the best contextual awareness and that we augment their skills so that they can drive better. So together with you, we have a process that works to safeguard quality. And we're designing our technology to really wrap around it and to help us do quality control at every stage. And it's because of this that we've managed to pull off this growth. As the journals have gotten more and more successful, they have attracted more and more submissions that are below our standard for publication. And what you see here is that while the submissions have grown tremendously, the rejections have grown even steeper. So today I want to talk about three key areas where technology makes a major contribution to help us all achieve this. The first one is to set a high quality standard right from the start. Every manuscript comes into the desk review stage. And our aim here is to weed out the substandard ones so that you can focus on making the good even better. Today, over 59% of all rejections are happening at this stage by our research integrity team, a number that has been continuously growing as we've received more of these substandard manuscripts, but also as we've gotten better at detecting them. So to do this, we've identified strong quality signals linked to the authors, their institutions, and the manuscript, of course. And we've created individual quality checks that we've combined into a quality funnel. And every manuscript goes through this funnel. The idea here is really that if a manuscript passes all the checks, it can go to editorial review. And if it doesn't, we send it to our research integrity team. And we've made great progress, but this is a hard problem here. And interpreting these quality checks requires balance and editorial intuition. So our research integrity team is touching every manuscript at some point during this funnel. To help them, we're combining all of the results from the quality checks in a comprehensive quality report. And this is available to our teams, but also to the editors during editorial review. These are technical checks about the technical quality of the manuscript, so you can focus on the scientific quality. The checks are language and scope assessments, or offer background checks and citation practices. And they allow us to do things that are beyond our own human capabilities. We can detect anomalies in the way our users are accessing the platform so that we can find possible review fraud. We can find patterns of paper mill papers in the manuscripts and in the figures, and we can highlight these manuscripts to our teams. And we can detect possibly manipulated images where we highlight repeated patterns, even when they're rotated, scaled, or desaturated. So when the manuscript has made it through this desk review stage, it's time to involve you, our editors, into this process. And here, it's incredibly important to have the best researchers from around the world, researchers with the right expertise and experience that set the bar and the example for research in their field. And we've done well. Today, our editorial boards represent the best institutions from around the world. It's because it's so important 
that we put so much attention into who we invite to these editorial boards. And it is also important that we grow them as the journals are growing. Especially associate editors are in high demand. Only well-sized editorial boards can cope with this growth without putting unnecessary strain on the individuals. So we're helping our chief editors by providing them insights about these boards. The geographical distribution, the board's engagement, particularly active individuals. We suggest candidates that could be invited. And here we provide context and insights about these people, who they are and why we think they would be a good match. Inviting them is of course easy and it can be personalized. And every chief editor has full visibility over every single individual on the editorial boards. They see all their roles, their current assignments, their assignment history, and accessing the review forum for each of these articles is just one click away. So we have now this great editorial boards. And what they really need as a next step is great tools so that they can get the job done effectively. Let me show you with the example of finding reviewers, one of the most challenging tasks throughout this process. So when handling a manuscript, we support our reviewers in various ways. Of course, it's easy to invite someone you know by putting in their name and their email address. But we also kickstart them by scheduling invitations to the best and most relevant reviewers from the editorial boards. And here they are in the driver's seat. They see who will be invited and when. They see who these people are and why we've suggested them. And it's easy to invite them right away or remove them from this list. Besides this, we also suggest the most relevant reviewers beyond our editorial boards. And also here, we provide insights and context into why we're suggesting them so that the editor can make the best decision. And these suggestions are important and relevant. Because this challenge is huge for everybody. When we looked for benchmarking data, the best we found was the state of peer review report from 2018 by Publons of Clarivet Analytics. Here, they surveyed 11,000 researchers, asking them why they're declining reviewer invitations. And 71% of them said they do this because they're out of their area of expertise. So when an editor at Frontiers invites someone with the name and the email address, so these are people they know, or at least they've done some research behind them, and they really want them. 18% of the people that decline these invitations do this because they think it's not in their area of expertise. So this is our benchmark. And when the editor invites someone from the suggestions beyond the editorial boards, I'm happy to share that also here, only 17% of the people declining do this because it's not in the area of expertise. So we've made great progress here, but we won't stop. We will continue to invest into better data, better algorithms, and better explainability so that the editors can make the best choice. So these are the three key areas I wanted to talk about. But there is a different perspective that I think that is really important to share, and that is about how we actually built this platform. Because it wouldn't be possible without such an engaged community as ours. Last year, we've received over 180,000 individual feedback items through personal conversations at events, for instance, like this, through surveys, through our website, by email. And they're mostly very positive, but they have great insights about things we could improve. So let me show you what we do with this feedback. We have an entire team that is processing them into pain points and opportunities. And we attach these to what we call user journey maps. These are maps that are describing our users' experience with us. They describe what is happening, how well every stage works, and how happy the users are at every touch point. So here we attach these pain points and these opportunities. And these maps are used by our publishing and by our tech teams to improve our processes and our platform. And when we design something new, 
We do this by creating mockups and prototypes, and we then test these prototypes with our editors. This is a true co-creation process where we keep iterating on these prototypes until they're ready to be implemented. Last year, we've done 184 of these, and I'm sure that this year we'll do at least double of that because this is a really valuable interaction for us. We learn from your experience and your expertise, and we can validate functionality early on. But to see how this really works, I would like to show you a little snippet from one of these sessions. What you'll see is Dr. Elliot, an associate editor in Frontiers in Microbial Symbiosis, and Sasha Krede, a user experience researcher at Frontiers. Sasha has created a prototype of an improved review invitation scheduler and has asked Dr. Elliot to try it out. Okay, so it's going to invite people automatically. That's useful. Um, okay, so I've made a queue and then I can invite them. Good, and I've already invited one person. Um, the person suggested by the author, what I usually will do is have a look at these, um, make sure that it... I mean, I will often will invite them. So let's have a look at this person suggested by author. Okay. Um, it might be nice if there are reasons why they've suggested it. I know some journals do it. I don't think we do it here. Mm -hmm. um, Where would you this, expect this information? Well, in this case, it would be nice if you hover over it, this if it appears. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that might be possible. That would be really So thank you to Dr. Elliot for letting us share this. This has been a tiny snippet now of a one-hour conversation. But even in this 50 seconds, we've already learned a lot, and it is going to help us build a better experience for all of you. For those here in Montreal, we do have a user testing booth in the main hall just up the stairs. I would like to invite you to join and experience it for yourself. And for those of you who are joining us online, we will be sharing information how you can join this program and participate. It's really a great opportunity to improve the experience for all your community. So to summarize, we really design our technology around this process to safeguard quality so that we can do quality control at every stage. We generally believe this is the only way how you can do quality at scale. And we're designing it together with you and for you. Thank you. Thank you.